or perhaps I should say good morning, Mr. Harold J. Brody, Professor Emeritus from our College of Engineering. Steve, what I would like to talk with you about this morning is what I am calling an oral history of the Institute. Because of the long period of experience which you had at RIT, and because of the tremendous number of contributions you made in a variety of fields, I've been anxious to interview you for some time. Now, I will raise specific questions with you and would like to have you reminisce. From time to time, I will interject a question or two. Well, why, don't just, why don't we just begin and see how this goes along? Uh, Steve, when did you first? All right, Steve, uh, you're on the air now. Do you want to try this out for volume? Well, I, I started out back there in fall of 1914 in the industrial teacher training course. As a student at that time? As a student. I, in high school, this is on now. Yes, this is on. Uh, in high school, I uh, majored in... Right, you said you majored in drawing and woodworking, and then you came to the Institute from West High. From West High School, and uh, the head of the drafting department there, Frank Wheat, uh, thought a lot of Mechanics Institute and their industrial teacher training. And uh, I had a full scholarship at the University of Rochester through the Calvary Baptist Church on Genesee Street. Ninety dollars all it cost. It cost ninety to go to RIT, or mechanics at that time. There were three terms and thirty dollars a term. But uh, he convinced me that instead of going to UR and taking engineering, that I specialized in drawing and he thought it was a great field for me. So I went to that's that was, that was in the fall of four, uh, 1914. 1914. And there were three-year courses in those days? There were three-year courses in those days. In the normal school were two. And of course, uh, Mechanics Institute for its industrial teacher training and our teacher training was in on the industrial. Mm -hmm. They uh, were recognized by 46 of the 48 states at that time. Pennsylvania and California required an examination all the rest of them. And there were 24 of us graduated in 1917, and uh, Crotch Wilson, Elmer Baker, and myself got $1,000 to teach, and all the rest of them got 900 <laughs> We thought we were something. <laughs> and uh, we went to Elmer, I went to Elmer and taught in the Elmer Vocation School down there. Oh, how long were you there? I didn't realize One that. year. One year. That was in the fall of 17. Yeah. And uh, I was in the draft, but uh, being in vocational work, they, I had a red X after my name. And every time they come down the list to my name, they move it down to the bottom again, put another red X after it. And the long, early part of May, they uh, called me. And I immediately went down to the, joined the Naval Reserve. 1918. This was, uh, yes, this was in May of 1918, and I went out to Great Lakes, and uh, I met uh, the uh, captain out there, Luckett, Captain Luckett, and uh, he knew someone who graduated from Mechanics Institute. So he took a liking to me, and he immediately put me into the six-year course of the aviation school. And uh, when I finished the six weeks, I was head of the uh, synchronizing gear department. And at that time, uh, they had uh, the synchronizing gears and the, and, uh, the gun oh, yes. was on top of the motor. Then every through the propeller. Then every four times the propeller would go around, woof. <laughs> Boy, that was quite a train. And then how long were you at Great Lakes? That was in September. When I finished up, it was in August sometime, and I taught in the school until January. And uh, in January, I was to be released. And uh, Captain Luckett called, Commander, not Captain. Commander Luckett called me in and wanted to know if I would go out to San Diego Naval Base and head up the department on this aviation. 
had a chance for $3,000 if I could get out by a certain time in January to go down to the, the Masonic School in Utica and head up the arts and crafts and industrial arts program down there. But uh, I didn't get out, so I didn't get the job. And then when I went home, uh, came home, I went uh, out to Knowles and applied and on a recommendation for an urban school. I mean, he'd been a, a good man out of Gleason's when yes. I came to school. And he recommended me to Knowles and I went down there and did some Rafting and some dining, uh, uh, designing down there, and then Herman, a couple of months later, called me to school and asked me if I would come back. So this was the fall of 1919. 1918. No, 1918 was the war, wasn't it? Still the war, but yeah. It must have been the fall of 1919. Yes, it was 1919. No. Because it was 51 to 1970. So then you were at the Institute. Uh, continuously from 1919 until you retired when? The second time. I retired in 69. You retired in 69. So you had it actually 50 continuous years there. 51. As a fact, 51 as a fact. As a fact. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I retired when Merle died. She died in the fall of 59. And I retired. I was 65 that December and I retired the next June. Mark said, uh, Steve, I want you to stay on for a year or two or three, but I want you to retire. And then you can teach quarter time, half time, three quarters, or full time, and it's all to I won't say it's all to your advantage, he said, to do this. Sure. So uh, I retired and some I wouldn't teach some summers and some summers. Yeah, I remember. Uh, well Steve, when you came back to the institute and uh, 1919. Who were some of the other faculty members there? Who were some of the administrators? Now, Mr. Randall had not come as president. He didn't come until 22, I think. I think that's right. I think it was 20. Barker. Barker was president. Barker was president. And he left right then, I think. He went as assistant superintendent of schools in Rochester. Mm -hmm. And Royal B. Farnham, who was teaching in the art school, was made the president. And very shortly he went to the Rhode Island School At of 22, Design. At 22, he went to Rhode Island School of Design, and uh, John Randall came in. Mm -hmm. That's right. Who were some of the department heads? Well, uh, Von der Locken was head of the art school, and uh, May Benedict was head of the food administration. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told his name. Oh, Crocker, Alan B. Alan Crocker was head of the mechanical and electrical and the industrial teacher training. Nice. There were just the three of us, just the three. Mm -hmm. I don't think there were two hundred students. You know, Is that right? I don't think there were. Mm -hmm. uh, well, then the, uh, the Institute went along during the 20s. Did the enrollment increase gradually? Very little, but it increased. Mm -hmm. And then they, uh, they had the industrial teacher training and I think 26 was the last year I used to teach the thesis and that and the course outline and subject matters and lecture on that. Yep. Well, the was, Institute, as you mentioned, had an excellent reputation in this industrial arts teaching oh, yes. training. And I guess also in the home economics. Oh, right? yes. Oh, we were one of the first in the country before Cornell had it. Yep. But then as the degree requirements came in in part of the state of New York, the Institute decided not to go towards the baccalaureate route. That That's time. right. That's right. And uh, so our program tapered off. And they, uh, after uh, Rand, Mr. Randall got there, they abolished the co-op, mechanic and electrical as such. And I think it was 1926 was the last uh, of the uh, teacher training. There's a fellow here last year, uh, Gutshaw. Maybe you, if you were at the alumni banquet, he made a name for himself, and he's written eight or nine books. And uh, these are all my students. Is that right? And uh, the other one, uh, uh, he went out to Brighton. He left Brighton. He went down. He was head of the uh, drafting and the artwork down at uh, school for the deaf down in uh, St. Paul. 
Kenny. And another one went through Columbia. You see, we, if you finished RIT three years, in one year, in one summer school, you get a degree. In Columbia, me, yes. And uh, Sam Raley, that was the one. He graduated from Columbia, and he was assistant dean of, uh, he worked up to assistant dean of engineering at RBI. And he was there just three or four years ago. And uh, I used uh, the book that uh, Hood, the uh, dean of engineering, and uh, it was Lawler, not Rayleigh. Rayleigh's the one that went down. And, uh, is this all about mm -hmm. uh, Rayleigh was the one, uh, this was Lawler, not Rayleigh. Mm -hmm. uh, well, then, uh, during the 20s, after Mr. Randall came, uh, there's another study that I've uh, read about called the Keppel Kimball Dooley study. These people were brought in to that's right to study what the institute should become, or should become where we of, fit. Yeah, the that's right. part of the city system, yeah. or that's right. part of the U of R, or that's whether it right. goes as an independent institution. And apparently, the decision was made to go as an independent that's institution. That's right. That's right. Uh, and uh, what's well, during the 20s, of course, Mark Ellingson came on as a young faculty member. Yeah, Toots came 26, I think he came around 28, Mark. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Sometime. Sometime in the late 20s. And then Dr. Charters and Dr. Tyler were brought in as consultants. That's right, brought in as consultants. Yeah. Now, uh, didn't the mechanical and electrical departments continue its co-op program during these years? No, they, uh, they abolished them somewhere in there, Leo. Because Somewhere's in it. And then they brought him back strong. Oh, I see. Campbell was uh, the one who contacted all the industries for the co-ops at that time in the early 20s. And I can't remember my... And, of course, in the 20s, we brought in the uh, School of Printing. Yeah. No, that came in 1937. The School of Printing? Yeah. Uh, was it 37? Yeah. I guess. Uh, Dr. From Ithaca. Dr. Ellickson and Frank Gennett Oh, yes. Are the ones that brought and Mark up. was yeah. in charge of that. Now, uh, when did Al Johns come on? Al was one of the old time. Oh, Al was, was way back in the 20s. Mm -hmm. Earl Carker. Earl Carker. He was Earl way Moore back in the 20s. Well, yes, he was back there, too. Mm -hmm. And at one time, he was the head of the electrical department, and Carker was head of the curriculum. It was a dual head. Mm -hmm. One had the curriculum, and the other had all the students in the program. You know, right. you see. Well, then what happened during the Depression? I imagine the Institute fell on hard times. Gee, I can't tell you. I know that we were cut 20%. And uh, instead of a 10-month contract, we had an 8-month contract. And we cut 20% besides. That was a shock. <laughs> it was a pretty rough in those days. It was in the 30s. Oh, yes, boy. that's right. Well, now, uh, uh, President Randall, I can remember once uh, you were saying to me when I had first come to the Institute that uh, he was a great fellow. He had about 30 ideas a month, but he insisted on putting all of them into, uh, into effect, and maybe one or two of them were good, but the other 28 or 29 were kind of... <laughs> That H, H D and L program, that was something. See, that was the Honor Diploma and Letter. Integrated. This was uh, to get away from the typical A, B, C, D, right. F grading system. You can't it? get away from that. Uh, you, know, you you got to rate them. Honor and, and yeah. H D and Diploma. And you give a diploma to the fellow that he's good, and you give a fellow a diploma and he isn't so good. They're not, you can't compare them. No, I remember when I came in 1939, that was still under discussion, was still used at that time. H.D. and L. Yes. They didn't use it very long. No, it was used uh, in the early part of the war. Yeah, the Mark, uh, that was uh, Chase, yeah. in a way with you. Yeah. Uh, well, now, uh, when did you, you got into evening work also. You were teaching, of course, your engineering, engineering drawing during the day. That's right. But then you did a tremendous amount in the evening. Yep, that's right. I taught engineering drawing, and then when Martin was moved uh, 
over to day school. I was in charge of tool and machine design courses in evening yeah. school, and uh, Cyril had the related subjects, Cyril the mathematics Thomas. and the physics and all of those things. And I had that until I uh, retired in 1960. I had that for many years. Many years. And uh, you had an excellent staff of uh, Oh, I had 14 teachers. and 16 <coughs> teachers for school design, machine design. Oh, when I retired in 1960, uh, Lacane was head of the mechanical department at that time, and uh, I don't know why, because uh, but he insisted that I resign from the in charge of tool machine design in night school, because he wanted a full-time man to do that. So then, then I come back and taught. Uh, Cams, gears, and mechanisms from then on, mm -hmm. two nights a week. You mentioned some of the students that uh, made an outstanding record. Do you remember some of the others that uh, went on that you had over the years? Oh, yes. I, well, some of them that were students when I was there, uh, Harry Babcock was head until he retired. Uh, Barker left the assistant superintendency of Rochester and went down to Savannah, Georgia mm -hmm. as uh, director of the schools down there, see, superintendent of the schools. And he took uh, Mert Edgecombe, uh, he took uh, Jim Shouty, it all graduated that year. They were juniors when I was a senior. No, they, they came, yeah, they were juniors when I was a senior. And this was during the war, and he took them all down to Savannah, Georgia. And uh, Murdechka was still there and retired. And Perry Babcock was uh, head of all the industrial arts in the state of Georgia. And uh, he was to come up here a year ago for his 50th. And he was taken sick and uh, he couldn't come. And he built up a tremendous blueprinting and drafting equipment business in Georgia. Great big place. I visited that. Was that right? Well, now, let's see, Norm Collister was a mechanical engineer. Norm Collister and uh, who was his pal? Norm Collister and who was his pal? I talked to both in the middle school. They were nice students of mine in night school, mm -hmm. and I talked to them in the day school. Well, now, wasn't Ed Pike also a mechanical department graduate? No, Ed Pike was a construction supervision. Well, that's right. And Paul know. Roach was another one. Mm -hmm. And uh, this Bramer Zeitler, Zeitler is one of my star basketball players. He was in that mm -hmm. course. Uh, I think he's in charge of Sewer's disposal at Fairport or Webster down there at one of them. Mm -hmm. He was up at uh, Watertown for a while. And then another of uh, the students back in those days was uh, Harry Crotch Wilson. And he, he's ended up as the head of all the industrial arts in Watertown. Elmer Baker, uh, these are all industrial teacher training. Mm -hmm. Elmer Baker went to uh, Batavia and was head until he retired two or three years ago for years up there of the industrial teacher training. And then, uh, uh, that's Rigby's, Rigby's first name. Well, he was an outstanding student. He was in my class. Uh, he went to Atlantic City. And uh, he was uh, in charge of all the industrial arts for one half of the state of New Jersey. Well, the Institute certainly had its uh, graduates in industrial oh, arts teacher yeah. training and the home economics. Ray Olson. All over the East, didn't they? You no, know, Ray Olson. Sure. He was a graduate of the mechanical, a friend of mine. Yes. And he was president of Taylor, Taylor, Taylor Instruments. Yes. I've often wondered, though, Steve, as I look back over the catalogs and late teens and early twenties, uh, whether the Institute didn't make a tremendous mistake in not going towards a baccalaureate degree at that time, particularly in industrial arts yeah. teacher training and the home economics teacher training, because they had a terrific reputation. Oh, well, I was so I, they, they sort of tossed it overboard. I was sick when John Randall uh, 
dispel the schools and the industrial teaching or anything. But at that time, that in the home economics was a whole school. Yeah. Clifford Alt was teaching then, and uh, Von der Locken was the head, and Haskell of the Haskell State and Glass Company in Rochester, he was teaching there then in the art school. You know, these, yeah. See, in my course, industrial teacher training, you have to take art work. Sure. I had, uh, and I went to night school and took three years of architectural drawing in night school why I was a, while I was a student in day school there in order, it wasn't in the course, in order to have okay. something extra. Sure. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Oh, there must be some others in there that I just can't think of now. But the three outstanding after I came back to teach there in the industrial teacher training was uh, Lawler, Just give it a name. Well, they're here. Maybe we can just stop. Uh, well, Steve, uh, following World War I, didn't the Institute have what were known as vocational board men here? They were sort of the GIs of World War I. Oh, yes. And did, did you teach any of those uh, groups? Oh, that's the 40 hours a week I had. You taught 40 hours a week? 40 hours, 8 to 5, 5 days a week, and 4 nights in high school. And in that uh, 40 hours, at that time, they considered and drafting 30 hours a schedule. Mm -hmm. So I got a third extra because I taught 10 more hours. See? <laughs> 4 nights in night school, $3 a night. <laughs> Three dollars a night. Well, three dollars. Well, night. that's before I was married. You see, I wasn't married till twenty-six. Well, now you uh, you were very much interested in basketball over the years. How did you happen to get interested in that and become director of that? Well, I, uh, as I said, I played, and when I come back, I don't remember. I've been trying to think about that, whether it was a student council or whether it was Mr. Farnham asked me if I would handle basketball, and I handled it for two years. And then I was so busy with the night school and everything that uh, I just couldn't do it. So they had another faculty advisor of basketball. That's what we call it. That's for wrestling start. Yep. Another faculty advisor of basketball. And he had Thompson, the coach, from Kodak Park, as his coach. We all hired the coaches, you see. Yep. And he went up to St. Lawrence, and they lost a couple of men on fouls. They only had four, so the coach went in and played. <laughs> Well, they fired him right away the next year. And uh, they asked me if I would come back and handle basketball. And I handled it from then up until, well, Lou came in 55, and I still handled basketball uh, until about 58 or 59. Oh, I see. And I turned it all over. When did Lee Fox come on as coach of basketball? Lee came about two years before the, the war in the 40s. I see. And then for four years during the war, we I had an intramural league in baseball, basketball, and bowling. I formed them all. We had the intramural league down at uh, at uh, the Brick Church Institute, and we bowled out there. And eventually, we even set the pins up because he couldn't get pin boys. We change off, things. and we'd have eight, and ten, and twelve teams in the bowling league. Now, basketball. Where did the Institute to play its games during the 20s and well, 30s? Well, uh, when I was in school in the first three years after, we played up in the annex in the top floor oh, yes. where photography was. And uh, we had the advantage of everybody because right in front of the basket, there was a beam across there. And we could shoot over the beam, see? And if it didn't have but a team coming in here, didn't have a practice to do that. We beat Warsaw High School 22 to nothing in one of the games up there. Well, in those days, Lil, we played the University of Buffalo, Niagara, Canisius, and St. Bonaventure. Twenty games so? in those three years, yep. and we never won a game from them. <laughs> of course, the other teams were, we played uh, Palmyra, Noor, Lions, and that's how I got some of the players. I went to Lions, we played Lions in 1919. Uh, they had three players there, Cutterback, Balsall, and Marshall. Oh, they were good. And they were only junior. Oh, boy, I contacted them and I talked to them. And they all came to the Institute. And Charlie Balls, who graduated, and uh, he went with a power and light company in Geneva. 
and he worked there for a while and then they made him head of the whole section down there then they moved him to Plattsburgh and he was uh, head of the power and light in Plattsburgh and then they moved him up to Williamsville they moved him up all the time yeah. and then uh, New York Power and Light. Then they moved him. The last time they moved him was down to Horseheads, and he's in charge down there. He's another graduate. He was electrical. Well, now uh, you played there in the Eastman Annex. Up on, was that on the third floor? Right? That's on the third floor. It had a low ceiling too. Was there? Oh yes, I'll say it was. You had to shoot over the beams. <laughs> and uh, when I came to the institute in 1939, they were playing. I remember it. Yes, Columbus he, Civic. Yeah. Well, Center. we left there. You know, as I told him at the, at the dinner the other night, I'm not saying I to boost myself, but I was all there was. That's I was right. a nurse, I was a doctor, I carried my medicine kit, I bandaged them, <laughs> I gave them first aid, I made the schedule, I bought the equipment. In those days we had two basketballs. Now they bring a dozen out to practice. I had two basketballs. One we'd save for the games and the other we'd play in practice. <laughs> And uh, there, then we went two years at Bausch and Lam on Lowell Street, on the fourth floor. Edison Tech was there then, and uh, we used to play there. Well, they'd call me up on Thursday and say, "Our Bausch and Lam semi-pro team is going to play on Saturday night. You'll have to go someplace else." Well, then I'd get in touch with the city to be, and I'd either go to Jefferson or Madison or Monroe or Franklin, one of those high schools. Well, we played there for two years. And then they, we had to abandon that because I couldn't agree on yes. dates or anything. And then we went over to the RBI band box over on Clinton Street over there. We played there for two years. Then uh, then uh, that was abolished. And then we went over to uh, we went over to the Genesee Roller Skating Rink over and back where the Osborne House used to be. They had a roller skating rink on that street and back of it. I didn't realize they played in all those different places. Now, when we came in 39, they played some up at the Columbus Civic Center, but you were also playing down Edgerton Park. Was that the Jefferson High Gym yeah. down there? That was after. We played uh, We played uh, at uh, the Knights of Columbus until the war, sometime after the war in yeah. the 40s. When that was over, they decided that they wanted to put on bingo and they wanted to do some other things up there. So after nine or ten years at the KSC, which was a nice court, a good court, yeah. we had to get out. That's when I got Jefferson High School. I see. And then we played at Jeff for nine or ten years until we had our gym on Spring Street. Mm -hmm. Eleven right. different gyms. <laughs> Just see. couldn't get a five dollar raise for, him. for a coach yeah. oh boy the student council would furnish the money yeah and uh, but the coach had to come from the institute and yeah. I'd have to recommend a coach yeah. here, you know. mm -hmm. it was it was quite a program but since we never could really get good schools to play we continued to play Brockport, which is our oldest rival, and Geneseo, Geneseo I mean. and then uh, Oswego is in there, and Buffalo State is in there, and then we played Oneon and Plattsburgh yes. and Potsdam and the rest of them. And then they went to four-year schools. That's yes. before we were a four-year school. That's right, yes. And uh, that was a little tough. I had to sort of beg them, you know, to get games. Sure, sure. Well, they didn't think we were respectable in those days. Yeah, they didn't think we were anything there. Steve, as I remember uh, when I first came to the Institute, and this was largely due to the tremendous work that you had done in uh, not only the day program, but also in the evening, and the excellent faculty that you had in the evening, the Institute was really looked on the place by the businesses and industries to send their people for training. Do you want to amplify that a little bit? You had a tool design major and a, and a machine, machine design, design major. Uh, they were four-year courses, two nights a week. At that time, I had 14 and 16 teachers working for me, and they were all excellent draftsmen in the city. 
in the... Actually employed right in the end. Oh, Gleason's and Hawkeye and Bausch and Lamb and uh, plenty from me. Some of those Florida. men were with you for years and years. Oh, yes. Yeah. Some of them got their 25-year uh, yeah. silver uh, cufflinks. Yes. 25-year. Charlie Knoll, Elmer Muhlendike. Harry Kipp. Harry Kipp. No, Harry Kipp. Uh, Gordon Kipp. Gordon Kipp Harry Kipp was his cousin. Oh. He taught there, but he didn't he didn't teach for me. Mm -hmm. But Gordon Kipp did. And for years. And Charlie Noel and Art Hooper, he was there thirty some years. Art Hooper was teaching before I was in charge of night school. Mm -hmm. And he just died here three, four years ago. You had a great group there. Uh, why do you think you had such an excellent program? What was in the curriculum? Was well, I don't field. know. In those days, uh, anyone that uh, got any place, even if, now when I was at Nolton's, if they took on a new man down there, he was in the drafting room for a year, an engineer. Mm -hmm. He was in the drafting room for a year. And if you didn't know drafting, how could you be an engineer? Mm -hmm. And so that was a big thing. And we, we boosted the math up, we'd make it tougher, we'd bring them in and give them a little exam to see where they fit, and uh, we made the math a little more difficult, and uh, we got in some calculus in there. It was a good course, and boy, the, the city just, they'd send them there, the they'd take these the kids out of high school, you know, in a drafting room, and they'd make them come up there and get their tool design, their machine design. Now at the same time, of course, there, was, there were strong programs in the shop area too, weren't there? Oh, excellent. Tool and die making. Oh, excellent. Making. Yes. Sure, I'm really run five nights a week and some days and Saturdays. And he had a tremendous staff too. And of course, they all had to take engineering drawing too. Didn't they? Oh, yes. No, they took blueprint reading. Blueprint reading? They all had to take blueprint reading. And then I wrote a book. I didn't, or personally, I didn't yes. like any books that were on the market that would fit in with the program that Sherm was given. Yes. So uh, Sherm wrote a book on shop, and I made a lot of drawings for him in that book, and uh, we set up the blueprint course that would fit in with the shop. With the shop. They abandoned that. Well, these days, uh, the training of people in the engineering drawing area, I think, has dropped off considerably. Yes. Oh, it had when I was near the end there. Near the end, yes. But uh, I guess there still is quite a demand for people in the machine tool area. Oh, yes. No question about that. Ted Spong, for example, who retired from Rochester Machine Industries, you went out of the new Ted Spong. Yes. Home. The Institute has employed him. He's now... Uh, doing his best to keep the machine shop filled with training and doing a very fine job. Of course, you see, I, a few years ago they decided uh, in the colleges to abandon the line. And shop, too. To abandon. Oh, yes. Yeah. But they decided to abandon drawing. Well, you know, it made it difficult because I've heard from a lot of people, especially some of them back at the U of R, that uh, these fellows that come through there and they're engineers and if you can make a drawing you can read it but to learn to read a drawing if you don't make it it's a little more difficult there's no question about it and uh, they didn't like it but the colleges around the country uh, threw out the, the engineering drawing and I think of it the last time they had it in day school I think was the last year I was there Yes, it's gone completely. They now. changed it from engineering drawing in the last four or five years I was there. And uh, I had a study up. I worked with Rush one year in a class. I was his assistant. We had about 50 in the class. Graphic analysis and descriptive geometry. Well, he taught that up at Middlebury. So I worked with him that one year in the class. Excuse me. And he boosted up another level in night school. And uh, I took over the graphic analysis. And script of geometry. Oh, I had to start one course in that place. Randall came over to me one fall and school started and he said, Steve, I got a problem. He says, we haven't anyone over in the art school that, uh, that can teach instrumental perspective. 
you know, we're not free yeah. in perspective, but just for men. And he says, can you do it? Gee, I said, I, I've never had it. I don't know. Well, he says, I'm giving you the problem. <laughs> Go and teach it. <laughs> well, did I work? And then I had a book on instrumental perspective. And I, and, uh, I think, I think a few parts of it, Whitmire uses now. It well, was all good. offset. Mm -hmm. And you could pull the pages out, see? Sure. And he took those pages that Ruth, uh, what from? I had Ruth. Is she still there? Yes, Ruth is still on the phone. Well, I had her as a student. And uh, when I stopped teaching it, she took it over. And then they cut that down like they did drawing, and they just took parts of it out and put it in. Because uh, instrumental, uh, Leo, if there are a lot of drawings that we see, and they don't look right, amateurs, yes. they don't look right. And it's 95% perspective. They never had perspective and they try to make a draw on there and they put this one down here and this one here and they don't come to the same eye level, you know, and it's tipped. And uh, that's the trouble with a lot of amateur painting. They've never had pers perspective. perspective. Yeah. And if you have uh, instrumental perspective, which they're using part of now, it makes it that much easier for freehand perspective. Mm -hmm. And they put it right in there. At least they did the last time. Yeah. Whitmire, you know, was a student there. Well, I used to get him jobs running the mimeograph machine and the janitor and everything else when he was a student. Uh, Steve, what do you think were some of the weaknesses of the Institute and what were some of the strengths during your years here? Well, uh, to me, the one big weakness uh, was the name. We had good faculty. They had some good faculty in the mechanical and electrical engineering back there in the 20s, and they hired faculty. And then, of course, Moorcock came in, and Clark came in. Uh, Al Johns was in there. Uh, the two Wilder brothers were teaching mathematics. Optics, yes. Yes, and then they, well, they went from the mathematics, from our department, over to the Rochester School of Optometry. Herb did, not Morris. Mm -hmm. Herb went over. Rochester School of Optometry, and then he left there, went up to the University of Rochester in their optics department. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they had that now or not. No, that's gone now. Yeah, well, he, he was headed up there. And uh, that's, to me, that was the big weakness of the school, because living in Rochester all my life, I know so many people, you know, they'd say, why did they get rid of that name? That's a terrible name. It's mechanics. Why, well, yeah. <laughs> What kind of a school is that? And boy, when it changed, mm -hmm. we, we got the degree there in 46. Well, let's see, the name was changed, as I remember, in 1944. Yeah. And then in 1950, uh, we became the first school in New York State to grant the Associate Applied Science degree. And then in about 53 or 4, the baccalaureate. Oh, I was a little early. Yeah. I, I was thinking it was in the 40s. Well, I got the, the name change, you know and the degrees yep. years makes sense. Uh, the name change was in 44, and I remember uh, Ralph Van Pearson and I were chairman of the post-war planning committee, we were the chairman of the steering committee, and there were several subcommittees, one of which uh, recommended definitely that the name be changed, and likewise that uh, we look forward to the possibility of granting the degree. You know, in the early years, in the 20s and 30s, you'd get your mouth washed out with soap if you even mentioned a oh, degree. Oh, I hope to say it. It was a dirty name, oh, <laughs> dirty we, word. <laughs> we, we weren't for that. We were for the average person to work and earn a living. Well, yes. We all work and earn a living. Sure. But uh, I think uh, you're absolutely right that the change in name was one of the biggest steps forward, and then the granting first the social oh, yeah. degree and then the baccalaureate. Of course, uh, I was always happy to know that I, I go down there now and look at the doors and all the doctors and doctors and I have well, you got a BS. Yeah, sure. I was hoping somewhere along the line maybe somebody give me one. <laughs> but I had that three year course and and when I come back to the school and they kept me on and oh, I mean, did this and that, I, I really feel grateful. Yeah. And that's cool.
Well, you made tremendous contributions. You, well, you were one of the ones that made it great, Steve. Well, <laughs> one of the many, I guess. Well, there was some, a small group there in the early years that stayed with it. I That's right. I think right. of fellows like yourself, and Hank, Al Johns, and Hank, Hank Bird, Bird, and Earl Moorcock. That's and, uh, right. Some of the other men there. And when Mark came back, he, he did quite a good thing for the Archbishop. Yes. Yeah. He, they, he came back there, and I, I talked with Meyer about Mittmeyer. Whitmire always consulted me because I brought him to school and brought him through, you know. And he went to Buffalo State, and when he was teaching here, they wanted him to come back. Yes. Mark said, "We want to talk to him." I said, "What? Well, I can't tell you anything." I said, "Things look good for the future." Why don't you stick around here and don't go to Buffalo State? He said, this is my first love. Mm -hmm. And he did. And it was only a year or two before Mark came in. Yes. That's fancy. That's some great things, too. <clears throat> well. So, Steve, I think maybe we're about running out of questions here. And maybe we should just sort of taper off and stop it at this point. I certainly appreciate your willingness to be interviewed here because well, these are things I'm glad that, to do anything for that school. I'm telling you, it's been my life, Leo. Well, you've made tremendous contributions to you. That, that's been my life being there all those years. Seeing it grow, yes, and I can't say from nothing. But, I really can't say from nothing. No. But, uh, from a it, very small, unknown institution. That's right, very small, except for... The, as I say, that, that food administration, boy, that was before even Cornell started. Yes. We were known all over. 